I am very honored to introduce our first speaker for today. Please join me in welcoming Rich Lyons, mm -hmm. Dean of UC Berkeley Haas School of Business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and welcome to all of you. This is, as they mentioned, uh, the oldest of our conferences. It's been running annually since, well, 21 years now. And these conferences are student-led and student-run. They were student-initiated. How about a big round of applause for our students? They, they, they really power a lot of what happens here. And they help me see things that I haven't been seeing. Let me start with a couple of stories, if I could. Um, one of the, you know, we have a man ambassadors uh, program here, and they're roughly 20% men in this audience. Uh, one of those man ambassadors from a couple years ago, I won't mention his name, that's less important, he went to a Lean In event uh, that Cheryl Sandberg was conducting, and I want to say there were about 200 people in the room, and he may have been one of perhaps 10 men. And he told this story to a group of people, men and women students here at, at Haas, and he said there was a question that was posed to the audience, and this is a big audience. And he raised his hand, he, he, had, a, he had something to say on the topic, and then immediately the thought crossed his mind. Am I speaking for me? Or am I speaking for the men in the room? And he realized he never had to question himself on that. And how often women have that question, or, or any identity group that's in a strong minority in, a, in any given situation. Those are the moments where you say, aha, I think I get it a little, little better. Those are important stories. Here's another story that's even more personal for me. So it was roughly, I had been teaching about 10 years. I was here at Berkeley on the faculty. And I was doing something that I'm, I'm not very proud of. I was on the, what Berkeley calls the Committee on Committees. That, that exists here at Berkeley. <laughs> so, so yes, I serve, and so this is, you know, when the campus has to strike committees for, for dean searches or whatever it is, okay, there's actually a committee that does that. And I was on that committee, and I was new to the committee. I'd been, again, postgraduate school for maybe 10 years. And I had an assignment. I had to put together a search committee. I want to say it was for a dean. I don't remember exactly what it was. But I got input from lots of people, and I was brand new on this committee, and I worked diligently, and people said, how about this person, how about that person? I got lots of suggestions. And then I brought my, my list to the committee on committees. And, you know, there may have been four or five people on that list, and I said, look at these people, you know, these people, these are great people. And they were all men. And somebody said, well, which, which women did you reach out to? That the list I was offering was all men didn't occur to me. And that only needs to happen to you once for you to realize there are things I'm just not sensitive enough about, okay? So this program is absolutely outstanding. This day is outstanding. So much of it has been going on in management and education across all of these terrific business schools. I mentioned the Ambassadors program. We had a program that the students initiated called 40 by 20. This is about four years ago. Could we get the percentage of women in our full-time MBA program, which had been running on average in the low 30%, could we get it up to 40% by the year 2020, six, six, seven years ahead. And we changed a lot of things, and the students worked very, very hard, and we all worked together. And the incoming class the following year was 43% women. And it was just an outstanding... <laughs> you know, when you are more intentional, when you are reaching out, when you are, are thinking about the pool, when you are thinking about that decision and what makes people come after you've admitted them, right? They're, they're not here till, till they're here. That's true of anybody, any identity group, right? And so it helped us get a lot better. We have further to go. But when you set your mind to these things, you start to realize that you can change these things. About two months ago, for the first time ever here at Haas, we pulled together all of our research faculty, our tenure-track faculty, and over a one-and-a-half-hour lunch period, 
we all discussed, just the faculty, uh, sort of a peer-to-peer -peer discussion on conversations around gender and ethnicity in the classroom. And we'd never done that before. But a lot of us realized we needed to hear each other's stories. And we all realized that the students are expecting us to address these issues. Something will come up in a case, and it was like, that was the perfect entree for you to have this discussion with us, the students in the classroom. And you didn't do it. And for many of the faculty for whom this isn't their natural expertise, they will sometimes not take on that conversation. And do the students notice? Yes, they notice. So that was part of what we had the discussion on with the faculty. There's much happening here, and there's much that still needs to happen. I just wanted to mention that, okay? Look, we are gonna work together, and the men and women together, part of this is fundamental, obviously. It will be, as we advance it together, a more equitable environment, both at home and at work, and those are some of the themes that will come up today. So let me introduce our keynote speaker and our, our, our own Laura Tyson. Juliette de Bobigny joined Kleiner Perkins Caulfield Buyers over 16 years ago. The role she was playing as Silicon Valley's first venture partner focused on helping entrepreneurs recruit the best talent. That is really her focus area. And of course to build iconic companies. But that talent piece was central to her passion. That passion comes from her deep-rooted love of people, which has manifested itself in many of her achievements, including, right, she's been featured on Bloomberg TV, she's an expert on uh, Silicon Valley's so-called war for talent, also millennials in the workplace, an area of great expertise for her, women in technology, developing cultures of innovation within organizations. She's a strong advocate for women and has helped create several key initiatives at Kleiner to support young and growing female leaders, such as Kleiner Perkins Women Leaders, KPWL program, and helped spearhead the creation of Chime Hack, a partnership along with Gucci and Chime for Change, and one of the largest female-focused hackathons. She's a strong advocate for students and young talent, has led the development of KPCB Fellows Program, a program that brings some of the best engineering, design, and product university students at KPCB portfolio companies in for the summer. She's also an advocate for philanthropy, contributing to leading organizations such as Product Red, acting as an advisory board member for Global Citizen, and most recently helping to co-found Beyond Type 1, an organization focused on finding a cure for Type 1 diabetes. Born and raised in the UK, Juliet moved to the States 20 years ago to pursue a career in high-tech venture capital. She's had the privilege of supporting entrepreneurs in companies such as Google, Amazon, Spotify, New Zealand, Progeny, and Enjoy. She now lives in Menlo Park with her two children. And hold the applause. We will applaud her and Laura at the same time. Let me introduce our own Laura Tyson, distinguished professor of the Graduate School and Director of our Institute for Business and Social Impact here at Berkeley Haas. She chairs the Board of Trustees of the Blum Center for Developing Economies on campus here. From 2002 to 2006, she served as Dean of London Business School. And prior to that, 1998, 2001, she served as Dean here, my predecessor, one of my predecessors here at Berkeley Haas. Member of the US Department of State Foreign Affairs Policy Board member of the President Obama's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness. She was also a member of Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. Served in the Clinton administration as chair of the CEA, the Council of Economic Advisors, and as director of the NEC, the National Economic Council. She's a member of the board of directors of AT&T, CBRE Group, and Silver Spring Networks. Co she is co-author of Leave No One Behind, a report for the United Nations High-Level Panel on Women's Economic Empowerment. Juliet and Laura, we are so fortunate to have you. Welcome and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
checking on the questions. Good morning, everyone. What a great, inspiring group. Don't you feel inspired? I do. Feel inspired by the energy. <laughs> now, both of us have a water here and cough drops, so we're going to try to project through our various throat ailments, and your inspiration is going to keep us going. So thank you so much. Um, Haas, I just want to mention one other thing about Haas here before we get started. Uh, Haas had, uh, was a leader, has been a leader in uh, women's issues in many ways, and one was appointing me as dean. In fact, at that time, uh, I was the first female dean of a major business school in the U.S., indeed in the U.S. and around the world. So Haas has uh, been here for a long time. And indeed, I have attended uh, most, uh, every year that I've been here, I've attended the Will Conference, including the very first one in 1997. So, um, you've heard about Juliet's uh, amazing career, so I'm going to focus my questions on things that she really has herself spent her life doing. And we're going to start with talent. Just the, the issue of talent. Uh, has been central to what Juliet does. Indeed, you heard she was the first partner in a major, uh, a major venture capital firm coming in with the uh, goal of working on helping to recruit uh, and retain talent, not just for the firm itself, but for all of those many firms which the venture firm itself helps to develop and spawn. So, um, let's start the conversation with talent uh, and basically have you share your thoughts and insights on how to identify and recruit the best talent. And while you're at it, how do you define what the best talent is? So how do you find it? How do you define it? How do you recruit? How do you retain it? Well, first of all, Laura, thank you. And Dean Lyons, thank you for having me here this morning and to the event organizers. Um, I uh, arrived in late last night from London, and I'm just so grateful you asked me to speak first thing in the morning, because if it was at the end of the day, we might be having a very different conversation. Um, but, um, but anyway, thank you. I'm, I'm honored, truly, to be here. Um, so, talent. Um, you know, it was very interesting. I, as uh, Dean, Dean Lyons mentioned, have always had a great passion for people, and um, that resulted in sort of the evolution of my career. We can come back to that. But um, at Kleiner Perkins, I was very lucky that I worked with, um, and in 2001 was introduced to the most inspirational men who believed in talent and believed in me as a young woman in this industry. Mm -hmm. And um, so my partner, who you know, John Dor, um, had always said, um, venture capital is about two elements, the product and the people. And the people are the drivers. And this is going back 16 years. And so the world was a lot more simple. It was a lot less crowded. There was no LinkedIn. There was no Facebook. It was a very straightforward operation ostensibly, but yet being able to identify extraordinary people was the key differentiator. And um, one of the great uh, experiences in my early career was we had just made the investment in Google. Mm -hmm. And how does one support two brilliant entrepreneurs who are changing the world? Well, you go and find them in Eric Schmidt, but no one had ever recruited the three-in-the-box CEO. And um, so in terms of finding talent, <laughs> talent exists in all places, ways, shapes, and forms. I know we'll touch on diversity, but I always believe that talent is about finding the best, but redefining the best, mm -hmm. and being curious to find the best. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Redefining the best is very important. One, one funny story I have, um, very early into my tenure when we were building Google, um, I sat with Sergey Brin and we were going to recruit a CFO for Google and we knew, we had a sense at that time, we were onto something quite special. Um, we just were sort of holding, holding our breath and keeping our fingers crossed as we built this company. And, um, and I said to Sergey, well, of course, we need to find you a great CFO, and that person will have been a CPA, and they will have you know, been a controller, and they would have understood treasury. And he looked at me, and he said, well, why? And I said, well, that, that's what a CFO does, and I've got experience in building these. And he said, but why can't they be a really brilliant PhD? 
and it stopped me in my tracks. Mm -hmm. And what the lesson that I took from that is approach everything with a fresh perspective mm -hmm. because life is changing and moving fast. And so the beauty of getting older, if there is any beauty, um, <laughs> is, that, is that one can bring the wisdom of experience, but the best people then bring it with the new. And, um, and I think, again, when it comes to talent, that's what you have to approach. I'm old in my industry. Mm -hmm. And so um, what one has to do is to make sure that you surround yourself with a diverse organization that truly can be a great team. So can I ask a question? Because you, you pointed out that when you started this, uh, many of the mechanisms that are now widely used, take LinkedIn as an example, to create broad, deep networks um, didn't exist. Right. So how did you go about? So it, you redefine what set of skills you need, you redefine what you're looking for, but still you have to go into networks. Were, were you working with existing search firms? Were you develop I, I assume because KP brought you in that in a sense they wanted to internalize the search mm -hmm. capability, that you were the search capability, but you obviously had to go out into networks and find people. So, so how did you and how do you now uh, locate talent? You, you, that's a key part of uh, its first do the search in some way and then do the identification and recruitment. So what are the search mechanisms you use? Well, I came from a background of retained executive search. I'd worked in that industry for seven years with two very prominent firms. And so I had a, a very good network, um, a good track record, um, and, and I could obviously, you know, sort of expand on that. And I also was part of a very established venture firm who was at the epicenter at that point of Web 1.0. Um, but I, I will say two things. Um, one is, this is something I believe in very strongly, um, every person you touch, you should touch with a view that you are going to touch them 20 years from now. And the way you touch them, the way you interact with them, the way you say no to a business plan, no to a job, um, has to be something that you can live and die by. Um, I will give you an example. We're an investor in a company called Juicero. It's hopefully going to be the Nespresso for cold pressed juices. Um, the new CEO, Jeff Dunn, is someone who I met 20 years ago when he was the president of Coca-Cola North America. I was trying to recruit him to become one of the Web 1.0 internet companies. He told me that he wasn't interested in that, um, that he wanted to change food services delivery. And 20 years later, he is running a Kleiner Perkins company. Mm -hmm. So you invest in people with the view for the long term. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, how do I find people? It goes back to my love of people. Um, I know that now you think that I'm quite highbrow and quite accomplished, and now I'm going to really lower the tone. My job is also about reading all the trashy tabloids like Page Six and the Daily Mail and things like that. <laughs> so I love reading about people. And so last night on the plane, I was reading through my pile of magazines. Some were The Economist, and one was Vogue. And there was a really cool article about this woman at Google who is part of the new cybersecurity team. Mm -hmm. She's 25, ripped it out. Who have I emailed this morning? That young woman. I said, I'd love to meet you. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. I love meeting cool and interesting people. Mm -hmm. so, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that, that leads really to the next question, which is, uh, I think at the level of talent you are recruiting, you're probably not recruiting directly from, uh, from business schools, but maybe that's wrong. But how do you, uh, this is a talent development organization, Stanford Business School, talent development organization, uh, London Business School. So there's a lot of talent. Um, how, do, how does Kleiner or you or these networks link to that kind of talent? Well, about seven years ago, um, what we realized is that if we were going to remain competitive backing the next generation of entrepreneurs, which, you know, is something that we, as, you know, work very hard to do, we had to get younger faster, like really fast. Um, when Mark Zuckerberg came onto the global scene, having founded Facebook, the average age of an entrepreneur and consumer internet went down by about 10 years. Um, no joke. Um, and um, that's really exciting. Um, and so what we decided to do um, was to create a program that could really support students to give them an opportunity to see what the world of a startup looked like. Okay. 
we're really privileged here because we have access. We live in the Bay Area, and we have access to all these companies. But if you're in Pittsburgh or the Midwest or somewhere like that, the lexicon of the startup world may not be at your front door. And so we created the Kleiner Perkins Fellows Program, which was intended to provide to the best and brightest juniors in product engineering and design a summer internship paid at one of our portfolio companies. And through that, they could create a network um, of relationships that would allow them to support them through their startup journey. It's been a fascinating education because what we've realized is that 90% of them want to return to the companies that they worked with. Um, we had to stop that the first year when all the CEOs started calling saying, do you think I can actually tell the person not to go back to college? And I said, if you do that, this program is dead on arrival. <laughs> um, but what we've been able to do is to harness that group um, for both their summer internship, their network. My partner at Kleiner Perkins, Mary Mika, who you know, does an internet trends report. We tap into them for that. They give us incredible ideas. Uh, my partner, Natalie Gavello, deserves all the credit for running that program. Um, she is the one that has put that on the map. And um, it has been inspiring for all of us to learn from it. And it was something that I personally felt very strongly about because when I started my career, I went to Northumbria University in the, in the UK and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I was lucky enough to get a sum summer internship at Procter & Gamble. Mm -hmm. And it changed my life mm -hmm. because number one, I decided with all respect to the UK that I wanted to come and work in America. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated by um, the power of American businesses, American brands, and um, that opened my eyes. And it also clicked into place academics and business because it made me understand that what I was learning in economics um, really had massive implication. And it was such a seminal moment for me mm -hmm. that I felt very strongly that I wanted to give an opportunity to students to experience this world. So, um, so that's something that we've done that I'm really proud of, and that has also helped us get younger faster. That's great. And do you uh, are those those are those are for under, undergraduate students from around the around the country? They yeah. are, and um, we work really hard on diversity, which is something I do want to touch on. That so, was, um, that was we, my next topic. So this is a natural lead in. So. What we realized, you know, and as many people say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. I think that was Andy Grove who, who mm -hmm. first said that. Mm -hmm. And um, what we realized is that we were so focused on sort of creating the program and getting, you know, the top students, that at the end of the first year, we hadn't actually thought about the diversity of the program. And um, we spent a lot of time really working hard to go to different schools, um, have a lot of different on-campus events, mm -hmm. um, doing specific women dinners. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my most exciting dinners was actually mm -hmm. with the female fellows and asking them to bring their plus ones, their friends, so that we could talk to. And I'm really proud of Natalie because this year we have 50% of the fellows are women. So Fantastic. shout out to you. Fantastic. Um, let's uh, continue with uh, the concept of diversity here um, and talk about, uh, obviously, as you know, within the community, there is uh, the issue of the relative underrepresentation, not just of uh, women, but women of color, of, of, of diversity in general in the tech technology sphere. So I wanted you to talk about that. What are the trends you see in terms of what tech companies are doing to try to increase the diversity of their workforce? And why are they doing it? Why are they doing it? What are their, their motives for, for increasing diversity? Why do they think it matters? Well, the motives are really simple because statistically it's proven that having a diverse leadership group, a governance group, an employee body, you know, having a highly diverse organization delivers better results mm -hmm. by a significant number, by about 20%. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th there's not pure altruism here. Um, it's about bottom line impact. Mm -hmm. um, now, what are we doing? The stats are out there. It's appalling. Um, two thirds of the most prominent tech companies are run by men. Um, 
87% of startups are run by white men. Um, every year, you know, the numbers move a little bit, mostly in the right direction, but they're not moving fast yeah. enough. So it's pretty depressing. But because I'm an optimist and I'm in the venture capital industry, um, I will say this, at least we're measuring it. At least we're putting it out there. At least we're talking about this. Um, you know, at Haas, hey, you've been on the leading edge because you've done an initiative like this for 21 years, and I applaud you. Now, so many schools around the country are doing this. I was in Berlin on International Women's Day, and it was really palpably exciting, actually, the level of optimism of um, women. And that day, I was at one of our portfolio companies um, called Go Euro, which is an integrated travel platform across rail, bus, air. And it started by Narin Sham, who is an Indian immigrant. He moved to Berlin four years ago, not speaking a word of German, knowing no one, because he wanted to start a company in a low-cost area. And he, from day one, said, 50% of my employees will be women and 50% of my engineers will be women. And we proudly invested in July. And um, it is incredible spending time with that team, which I happen to do on International Women's mm -hmm. Day. And so it can be done, but the call to action is this, and this is the responsibility to all men and women, is it has to start from the beginning. And so I always say to a founding CEO, unless you're going to make a commitment from day one to have a highly diverse workforce, you will not be successful. It is very hard when you become 200 employees to suddenly turn on the pipeline. Mm -hmm. It isn't just about statistics, it's about culture. It's about flexibility. And so I think that what we have to do in the most constructive and positive of ways is to talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, in that example you used, or take someone who from the beginning says, I am uh, committed. I recognize that there's going to be tremendous business uh, profitability and success from diversity. Talk about some of the things that you see that um, a company might do to actually enhance that. So they set the goal. It's going to be there from the beginning. Um, they're going to search for talent, perhaps using you and others like you to get the diverse talent. But what are some of the other things that you think, based on your experience, the most successful firms do to support and promote diversity? Are there certain practices that you think really Well, help? there are, and some are, and again, this is the beginning of the journey, and we don't have all the answers, clearly because we're not doing very well. So if any of you have some great ideas, my email is available. Please email me and I would love to hear from you. Um, but what I would say is there are some tactical initiatives and some of you will have read about, um, you know, such as Google really putting in place um, development centers in cities where there are a higher percentage of underrepresented minorities mm -hmm. and funding education programs, mm -hmm. whether it's Facebook and their huge commitment to code Org. Um, so it's really going down into the middle school level um, in communities and being able to ensure that there is an active commitment to coding that is in the curriculum, that AP courses are in existence, and that companies are going on campus to really go and make that happen. So that's some of the tactical elements. I've talked about the measurement. Um, Apple produces um, statistics not only of percentage of women, but percentage of new hires that are women and are underrepresented minorities so that people can start to see movement of the needle. The softer ones actually trend into less gender and minority specific, but what I just call general good business practice, good hygienes. And those are things like employee flexibility, um, mm -hmm. collaboration, sharing, training programs, removing gender bias. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, this is um, a, an area that I am fascinated by because we're in a really interesting moment in time of the workforce where we're spanning the baby boomers through Gen X, through millennials to Gen Z coming in for the first time. You've got four very different cohorts of employees who have 
different norms, different ways of working, and the most sophisticated and successful organizations are going to have to evolve themselves to develop into that. Can you, I know you've been uh, focusing on um, millennial issues, so can you talk a little bit about if you are, again, if you're committed to uh, seeking out millennial talent, uh, do you notice uh, differences? There's a lot of you know, discussion in, in the press about differences in the expectations of millennial uh, students in terms of wanting more balance in their life or wanting uh, to work for a company that has a broader social mission or wanting to work for a company that is really very much publicly committed to uh, diversity. What are some, uh, do, you, do you think there are differences in terms of what millennials want and, and therefore is that changing organizational practices? The short answer is yes. And there are some subtle differences and then some very acute differences. The interesting thing, again, I think living here in the Bay Area is the following. Um, I've had the privilege of living here for 16 years. I'm a mission-driven person. I think that most people who start a company by default are mission-driven people who create mission-driven values. Millennials are mission-driven. So one could argue that you know, that hasn't really hasn't changed. changed. Um, what is fascinating, and again, it's being driven by technology, is the way that we work, the way that we interact. Millennials want to be able to have a more collaborative environment because they're used to collaborating on social media. Um, they want to be able to use workforce systems such as Slack to be able to have discussion because it's efficient. They're more comfortable using FaceTime than a lot of people are. They value leisure time, not because they don't want to work hard, but because they're always on. Mm -hmm. um, they value um, personalization, but being part of a global environment. So what is fascinating to me is that technology has been the driver mm -hmm. for many of the evolution of millennial behavior, which I, not in that cohort, sadly, I would say that I also am. And so <laughs> the way that one, and so it is an adjustment. Now, you know, I would tell you, and I had to actually, you know, it's funny, we're going through um, sort of a redesign of our offices at Kleiner Perkins, and we put a lot of thought into this, which is um, how can we create more informal you know, areas where we can right. sit on the floor, right. network, right. brainstorm, collaborate, not just with our entrepreneurs, but mm -hmm. for ourselves. Um, something that has, you know, that companies I think are struggling with, and it started in a very sort of distinct way called hoteling, but now it's actually having a flexible workforce, which is, is it acceptable to be able to have people work from home? You know, um, right. Companies that get into trouble when they actually reduce, you know, re re retract that policy. So I think that all bets are off today, mm -hmm. but I really am actually very excited by the possibilities for what it means with productivity if you have a results-oriented culture. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. something that, again, I look to Facebook and think they have done an extraordinary job of recognizing even 13 years ago is that in a tech-oriented environment, engineers like to work weird hours. And um, does that mean that everybody has to work weird hours? Well, by the way, designers work weird hours, and some people want to sleep later. But the reality is, if you're delivering on your job and you're outperforming, then that may be OK. But it puts pressure on managers and leaders to be able to set up that environment so it becomes the norm. And I think, Laura, that's the friction point that we're at, mm -hmm. which is because you've got four distinct cohorts of right. different management, Perfect. you know, it hasn't yet evolved into the organization. So it puts pressure on leaders to be able to take a step back and say, what do we want? What do we create? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in, in the world of flexibility, so flexibility often comes up, in, and we're going to move now into sort of gender issues in particular. So one of the things that I would say was a, a constant theme around the world in the No One Left Behind report, which is about women's empowerment in the world. But whether you have a very developed country context or a very, very poor mm -hmm. country context, the issue of flexibility of work 
which kind of shows up in unpaid care. So that basically, around the world, women do three times as much unpaid care as men. Uh, that is true, in, again, most developed to the least developed countries. One of the things that allows families and women to deal with this is workplace flexibility. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I would say one thinks of Silicon Valley as a very high pressure environment where basically first and foremost, it's not just mission driven, but it's mission driven with a claim on your time and attention, which can be 24 seven, both in venture capital and in the tech firm. So how does one, how do you think of flexibility in this environment, maybe maybe it's impossible. Maybe it literally. I don't think is it impossible. is. I think we're scratching the surface of flexibility and what that means. Okay. And as I, you know, sort of l l look at that statement of the sort of the level of um, claim on one's time in Silicon Valley, I would I would submit that that's a claim on one's time as an entrepreneur. And so okay. Um, okay. I think that if you're starting and building anything, whether you're in Des Moines or whether you're in Berlin. Sure and you're building something, you're working really, really hard. It is a sprint. Hopefully it's a healthy sprint, but it is your passion. Um, and so what I think we have to do is to recognize that today's sharing economy is providing a huge opportunity for flexibility. Again, on International Women's Day, I got into an Uber and this amazing Russian grandmother was driving me and I just was like, girl power. And, she's, and, I, and she said, I love this. I earn my own money. I can work my own hours. I can see my grandchildren. And you know, wh whether you want to start your own company, you're part of a company, you're running a company, you're dipping in and out of the workforce. One of the issues that we've had is getting, you know, it's something that I've talked about in the past, which is an issue for all of us, which is the scissor effect. It is that point in your early 20s to your sort of early 30s, that first time the scissor hits, and then a decade later when women are tripped out of the workforce at alarming rates. Um, why? Because of all the reasons, getting married, having children, not having the right level of income or support. And, and Cheryl has talked a lot about this, which is just lean in, just stay at the table and just try and make it work. And I am a huge proponent of that. But as we get into flexibility and we get into the sharing economy and we get into now newer ways of working together, I am hopeful that it will allow and empower women and men to be right. able to structure their working lives to suit them at that moment at, in time. At that moment. That's very optimistic, and I think it's really, it really important. And as you said, um, there are different generations that may come with different expectations. So uh, my son and his wife and their daughter, are that he, they're very millennial in terms of their expectations of work. And they are asking of their employers uh, to, to adhere to greater flexibility. There is much more generous uh, family leave policy being offered by the best employers in the country, sick leave policy to take care of an elderly parent. Um, so, uh, so there's, I think your optimism is reflecting the fact that there are some important changes going on, in part in response to millennials themselves asking for it. But going back to something um, earlier you said when you talked about diversity and it comes back to flexibility is the importance of role models in that. And it yes. is the importance yes. of, uh, it was something I missed when we were talking about companies, I am a huge believer yes. in the importance of role models. And, um, you know, if you can't see it, you can't believe it. And right. I think that's important for diversity. I think it's important in this flexible working environment. Mm -hmm. It's for people to be able to come out and say, this is the company culture. This is what I've built. Um, a friend of mine, Lorna Bornstein, has a company called Groca, which is um, a platform to allow you know, whether it's fitness instructors or chefs to be able to share and create their ideas. It's a deep technology platform. And she created the company from day one and said, I want this to be a very effective but flexible and supportive work culture. And I think there will be more people like that, and she's being very vocal about this, that will come out and say, it's okay to do this um, and to create this, but you've got to have results. So look, I think let's, let's continue a bit on the importance of role models because I couldn't agree with you more. That again was one of the findings of this report is again around the world you have some amazing examples. Uh, for example, in, in India where there was an effort to put 
uh, women in charge of uh, some local government positions, and it led to a real growth of women coming forward to take those positions. I mean, so you actually see over time the visibility of a, of a female leader leading to interest uh, and therefore success of women moving up. So I, I completely agree with that. And um, one of the things, I know that you do, do work on this, and one of the arguments for, say, the controversial uh, effort around the world to, say, increase uh, women's leadership as role models by, say, setting a target for women on boards. What do you think of that notion of uh, targeting something um, and saying, okay, if we had a third of the positions on a company board women, that would create serious role model benefits for all of the female employees, for women moving up through top management. How do you feel about that, that mechanism? So um, this is where I, I fear that I'm about to contradict myself because I'm a big believer in measurement, mm -hmm. but I'm not a big believer in quotas. Oh, and um, I mm -hmm. um, have studied this a lot because there are some um, very good organizations, particularly, um, you know, and some legislation, um, particularly in Europe, mm -hmm. um, where they have mandated 30% um, of people have to be on boards. Mm -hmm. And it has had impact. It has had movement. Um, Here's what I believe. I believe in a meritocracy, and I believe that I have earned the right to sit at the table, and I don't want someone checking the box because I'm a woman. Um, right. And right. so I want to make sure that we create organizations that actually realize the business results and the business impact, mm -hmm. and are not bringing women on board just to hit a quota. So I, I, I completely agree with that. I, I do. Uh, I, I've sort of taken the, the same uh, position for, for years on this issue. Um, one of the things that I, fe I feel kind of conflicted about or uncertain about is when you say that, when we say to ourselves, we believe in meritocracy, mm -hmm. and therefore we don't want to be ourselves put into a position because we were a woman. On the other hand, I would say in my own life, and I will be very clear about this, on more than one occasion, I have benefited by being the target of what I would call affirmative search. So people say, I would like to appoint a woman. That, that actually matters to me. Therefore, I am going to look more broadly than I would normally look. I'm going to look in places where maybe uh, I wouldn't have found this person, but she develops. Um, and then, of course, if, if you do a broader search with the target in mind, you may find meritorious talent, which otherwise would have been overlooked. I mean, the problem with a meritocracy argument, which I completely adhere to, is it depends upon where you search for merit, and it also, to some extent, depends upon how you define merit. Because uh, we know, for example, uh, that women tend to be in lots of psychological research, underconfident compared to men who are overconfident. So women may not be out there as much selling their merit. They just don't feel their merit. And I think you've worked on this imposter syndrome, so you also think about this. So I, I just worry about once you say we're for meritocracy and we're against quotas, and I, I'm with you on that, but then I worry about all the consequences of that. So what do we have to do? to make sure we're not overlooking talent? What do we have to do to really judge talent? Because if women really are underconfident, they may not appear on paper to be as talented as they truly are. So I am so settling in for such a good chat right now. This is really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like gearing up for this. Um, and I think hopefully we agree on this. It's complicated. We do, so. we do, which is why the debate is fun. Um, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt said, um, nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. And I really well, hold that close. That is a great quote. So let's start from there. And every great. woman here, hold that right here yeah. in you for the duration. Um, so going back to Laura, your statement uh, about affirmative search, that's because you're you and you're pretty special and there aren't many yous around. And I say that with the greatest respect but the greatest level of reality. And so if we operated on the basis of that, we're going to stay at subset numbers. 
I think that in today's environment, Dean Lyon's comment about just making that mistake once and then having it being part of the lexicon is the way that we have okay. to operate. Mm -hmm. And I come back to good business practice. 50% mm -hmm. of the world's spend is in the hands of women. You know, 55% of the consumers are women. If you're in a business where the consumer is likely to be a woman, you should have women on your boards. Um, <laughs> And, you know, I think that, um, you know, Howard Schultz is brilliant in so many ways, but he made such a bold move about, I think, four years ago uh, when he hired a 29-year-old tech entrepreneur called Clara Shee to be on the board of Starbucks. She didn't know anything about governance. She didn't know anything about being on a public board, but guess what? She knew about being a 29-year-old mm -hmm. consumer who was going to Starbucks, who was really smart on technology issues and social media and was an entrepreneur. And the governance stuff? Well, all those 60-year-old white males, they could teach her hours of governance. <laughs> so She could go to a course on governance. You know, I look at that and say, you know, Today's board should be wildly emboldened to go and put some kick-ass women on their boards of directors and know that they're going to add value in this discrete area and they should support that person and help them grow and evolve and develop. Otherwise, they're not, it's just not good business. Mm -hmm. And so I think that every board today has a responsibility, not just for women, um, you know, blacks and Latinos are 30% of the population and they represent 1% of entrepreneurs. That's just wrong. Um, and so I think it is just so important that boards take bets because let's face it, boards aren't perfect. And we all know that, yeah. so they can afford to take some risks. Right, <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, th I think, uh, again, history, uh, things really have changed and, and you're underscoring the way. I mean, when I... Uh, we know one of our, our mutual friends, Mary Meeker, who works at KP. Uh, I was on Morgan Stanley's board for a long time. When I was appointed to Morgan Stanley's board, which was in the late 1990s, I can assure you there were no uh, set of cases that actually uh, underlined the business value of having a woman on the board. There was a lot of external pressure brought by organizations like Catalyst onto the financial community to have at least a woman on each board. That, it wasn't so much on the basis of a business case. It was more on the basis of, I don't know, fairness, equity, uh, uh, social justice. Um, if we go fast forward to today, I would say, having just reviewed all of this literature for the UN report, and you know the literature as well, there is more and more and more evidence. Every day there's evidence, a lot of it coming from business schools, some of it coming directly from our own scholars here about the business benefits of diversity. But I want to say that it has not, that, that case has been developed in the last five to ten years. It didn't exist before. The research hadn't been done before. And so we have to continue to make the case, mm -hmm. and that's the case that really should go to, uh, to, to CEOs, to entrepreneurs starting a company, to uh, boards of directors in terms of, you want to do this because this is part of your business success, and we've got to keep, keep doing that. So I think that's really very important. Talk a little bit, so while we're on the issue of women's leadership, um, Talk about a little bit more in detail about the Kleiner Perkins women's uh, leadership effort that you're doing uh, internally that you've developed. So this is something that we felt and have always felt very important um, to our ecosystem of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, going way back to the beginning of my career when I joined Kleiner Perkins, I was um, the first female partner. And, you know, now 20% of our partners are women, including my partner, Mary Mika, Beth Seidenberg, who's one of the foremost life science investors. And 
Um, when I joined Kleiner Perkins, John Dorr said to me, um, our most important job together, Juliet, is to get more women into the firm. And it's a commitment that the firm has always taken, you know, very passionately. We've always tried to back great women entrepreneurs. We want to see. So all of you women out there with a business plan, yeah. send them my way. Um, we want to see, you know, um, and back great women entrepreneurs. We want to support women on boards. And so, you know, what we realized naturally about six, seven years ago was that there was a wonderful cohort of women that we were starting to see, many of whom I'd quote unquote grown up with in the industry, mm -hmm. like Marissa Meyer and Cheryl Sandberg and Susan Majewski and others, that we were just friends, but we were busy and we didn't have a time to really spend time with each other. And we really cared passionately about the same topics. And so we would meet informally and, um, you know, and get together. And then we decided at Kleiner Perkins, let's formalize this because we actually want to bring along the next generation. Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to have people bring the individuals that they're excited about in their organizations. Because also we recognize that um, if we were going to do this well and this was going to be sustainable, we had to do. So I'm a big believer in bringing your plus one. And I actually have plus two today, who is my daughter yes. Charlotte and her best friend Elsie. And they're in the sixth grade. And they're my future women leaders. And um, <laughs> You know, but we d we did this um, organization and we said, bring your plus one, but your plus one has to be the most inspiring up and coming leader in your organization. And this event naturally grew and we did some great events. Like last year, I had um, John and Omid Kordestani and Claire Hughes Johnson, who had worked at Google and, and now is the CEO of Stripe, talking about boards. Um, Claire just joined the Hallmark board and we had amazing women and men because we always you know, sort of like to get diversity, but we flip the diversity numbers, so it's majority women um, at our events. And we really create these networks and these forums, and we provide some education, and then we bring it down into our fellows program. The idea is this, let's connect everybody right. and let's share ideas. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think very, very important. And I know that there are lots of really good organizations within Haas trying to do exactly this connection. So I would encourage all of you then to uh, send in your entrepreneurial plans as well. Please, um, please do. And to also help each other because yes, that is something that's really that. important. It was either Madeleine Albright or Katie Couric or I don't know who said there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. And I take that very seriously. It, it was Madeleine. Was that it, okay, it was Madeleine Albright who said that. Yes, it absolutely was. Um, so while we're talking about Kleiner Perkins, I think it's uh, uh, important to raise the issue of uh, the uh, unsuccessful suit against Kleiner that was brought several years ago now by one of the, uh, by Ellen Powell, um, and it was a suit based on gender bias, and uh, afterwards she left the firm. Um, what are some of the lessons that you and KP learned from that experience? Well, um, you know, as I've said, I mean, we've always cared about diversity, so this was a very painful time for us. Um, what we've realized is there's so much more to do, and it has a palpable energy urgency um, that cannot be ignored. Mm -hmm. It's it's something that we are really continued to, to do what we've always done, back great female entrepreneurs, have great female partners, and build organizations that are transparent and diverse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot more to do. And a little bit, I guess it does go back to, again, what, what Rich says, which is sometimes you recognize, you, real, you realize things or recognize things that you hadn't thought about before based on just being put in a situation where all of a sudden, so, so in thinking about um, this case, which I think was probably a terrific uh, shock to the firm, um, were there things that actually uh, you have changed as a consequence or is it just basically heightened the overall commitment to um, promoting uh, women's leadership and diversity? I think it just heightened our continued commitment because we all cared about it so passionately. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a product of that. I had two great mentors in my career, um, John Dorr and now sadly deceased Bill Campbell. 
And mm -hmm. they both put me front and center into every career opportunity with the greatest level of respect and support. Uh, I've been really fortunate. Mm -hmm. I want to pay that forward. Um, and, mm -hmm. um, and so that is, you know, that is our continued commitment. Okay, fantastic. I think we have some time for questions. And um, so I'm going to encourage the audience to think of great questions. Uh, we have some moving mics. And um, let me see if there are any questions. Uh, right in the front, okay. Hi, my name is Sue Oliver. Uh, I'm from the UC Davis program, cross-pollinating to this event. Uh, my question is regarding the discussion between quotas and um, meritocracy. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we don't need um, a, a quorum or a population in order to properly measure the women against a standard for meritocracy, and so maybe quotas are something that would work to get that population in, in order to then identify metrics to elevate the women through the organizations such as Laura Tyson. Your thoughts? Do you have any thoughts? I, I think that there are some really good organizations that are already tackling that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, certainly Catalyst, I think, does a good amount of work on that. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, something that I use as a great reference point. Um, and what is exciting to me is seeing organizations now, companies in my sector, really commit to diversity studies and evolve them. So. We're in early days, but um, I think that there are uh, some good work that is being done. And I think that here's what's exciting right now. We're talking about this all the time, and that's only good. Yeah. So I guess I, I would just add to that. I actually think that the work that's ongoing about uh, implicit biases is critically important here. Because what we know is that the way both men and women evaluate others, uh, evaluate women, does differ. And we now know something, we know a number of things that are verified in the literature. We, we know that uh, men are, are viewed to be more aggressive than women. We know that women have more emotional intelligence than men on, on test scores. We, we know that uh, women tend to be underconfident uh, and men tend to be overconfident. So that, for example, in negotiations about salary, uh, women would tend not to negotiate. They would be more likely to think, I'm not worthy of the pay increase. Okay, that goes to the kind of imposter syndrome. Okay, you're, you're always thinking, I'm not quite as good as people think I am, uh, which is why the Eleanor Roosevelt quote is so important here. So there are all of these implicit biases. And I think that all, a lot of the firms, and I'm sure KP is doing it, and a lot of the firms are doing it, and we do it here, is to really get people to recognize that there are biases in evaluation. And they work in predictable ways. And once you've identified them, you can remedy them. You can remedy them. So you can actually say, for example, pay equity is a really wonderful example. Now, what's happening around uh, this part of the world now is that basically companies have been called on the fact that there are inequities in their pay. They've looked at it and go, yeah, there are gender inequities. I don't know where they came from. I didn't mean for them to be there. I meant to reward equal merit equally, but gee, I'm not doing it. So let me change my pay equity evaluation process. Let me actually change the organization to deal with the bias. So I, I think I don't know. I, I tend to think there are things going on here. I well, I think you're hitting on something at a larger level, which is transparency. And um, transparency. I think that transparency is critical, you know, every way. But again, coming back to millennials, it's one of the things that millennials really require. So, you know, I, I want to know what everybody is paid. And it should, there shouldn't be any secrets. I want to know, um, you know, sort of the percentage and the, you know, quotas or the percentage of women, et cetera. And, and 
Laura hit on something which uh, which is important, which is really reevaluating and thinking about hiring practices, because particularly in technical professions, what we've learned is that um, you know women will come in and play very well in certain interview formats, but um, when it comes down. <laughs> to a structured interview, a deep technology problem, even though they may be deeply technical, mm -hmm. they will not be as um, confident um, to express their opinion. And so, um, you know, transparency and then a constant reminder and reevaluation um, and measurement, measurement. You know, looking at a startup company and saying, well, why are women attriting out of the interview process at this point? What are we doing wrong here? Who is on the interview committee? And what, um, and, well, you know, and Frida Kapoor Klein has done some great work in this area um, about that. But I think all organizations should have unconscious bias training because it's just good best practice. Right. And for those of you who don't, uh, Frida was, has been a speaker here. Mm -hmm. she's, she's great on this work. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, let's go all the way back, because otherwise the people Hi. are back. All right, let's go all the way back. Right Hi, uh, my name is Michi Kaifu. I'm a consultant, and I'm a uh, founder of the similar sort of women uh, alumni organization from uh, my university back in Japan. And uh, I have a question regarding the mentorship uh, situation. Uh, there, I believe both in US and Japan, there is a big pool of women who are capable of becoming the leaders, but they see these people in the mentorship uh, or the uh, superwoman uh, situation. They, you know, a lot of them believe that, oh, we can't do that. They lose confidence, they cannot step up. What do you think is the institutional effort that the business uh, world should be? Not just the message within women, but also the business world should do institutionally to encourage these sort of potential women to become leader, uh, not to lose confidence against the super women in the um, you know, role model situation at this moment. Well, um, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur, so any time I hear the word institution, I sort of, it, it sort of recoil, so I have to sort of just ingest it into, into my world, but I, I know where you were going with that. Um, you know, so mentoring is a really interesting subject because, and I think Laura would agree with me on this, because when we grew up, there weren't that many m mentors available, and we kind of had to do it on our own. And um, so I grew up in a world that said, you don't actively rely on a mentor to get ahead. And yet, what I have realized, as I said, I have been the beneficiary of great informal mentoring. Um, and that really made a huge difference in my career. So I've reversed my thoughts on that. I think that mentoring is critical, and it's critical for a next generation of talent. 60% um, of millennials are open to considering another opportunity, and 21% of them have moved in the last year, which is three times more than a Gen X would move. Why? Because they don't feel that they are getting sufficient mentoring and leadership. It is part of their psychology. So if we are going to retain talent, we've got to mentor them. And we've got to mentor them in a way that reduces friction in the system and is flexible. And again, coming back to Facebook, they have invested heavily in developing mentoring programs um, so that they can really mentor the young women. But I um, first of all, delighted that you asked the question. It's something that I've had to evolve my philosophy on. Um, and the question is, what works for the organization? A couple of things with mentors. So I think mentoring is important, um, but sponsorship is equally important, and they're distinct. Um, mentoring and sponsorship should not be lifelong obligations. Um, they are, I think, for specific situations and moments in time. And a mentor can take on many shapes and forms, and it shouldn't be used as a crutch. And we as organizations and we as leaders have got to invest in that. And I throw out and submit to you, you should all be mentors to someone. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm a huge believer in paying it forward, whether informally or formally, be a mentor, find a mentee, but inspire someone to do what you're doing in whatever shape or form that is. Mm -hmm. And I would say as you move up, I would completely agree, sponsorship is also something you should do. I, I would agree with 
you, Juliet, that I don't think that given my uh, career um, and when I started, there were a lot of mentors. But it turns out that I have benefited tremendously from sponsors. People who decided, and many of them were men, that they, this, I was someone they were going to take a bet on, that they thought that I would be someone who could do this job, and they sponsored me into the job. And I think probably, given what you said about John and given what I know about Kleiner, that that happens there too. So the sponsorship part is a very important part of, of the next step, and there are uh, lots of examples. Companies actually do try to organize uh, management to uh, develop sponsorship-like activities, and I think that's very important. In terms of what a middle-level manager or high-level manager uh, job description might be, it might include mentoring or sponsoring um, mm -hmm. diverse candidates who are Credited. just entering and moving them through the... So I think you can also design the organization to encourage this, mm -hmm. and I think that's important. All right, we have time for one... We have time for one last question, <laughs> and, and, we, and we have it identified. <laughs> In search, especially sorry, especially when you can when you talk about having you know one woman on that Starbucks board with a lot of other older men. What do you? How do you in the talent search deal with the phenomenon of tokenism? So you have one woman, and then they're like, okay, we have a woman. Good job, us. Mm -hmm. And that can and that can happen, right? You know, and that worries me right now because if you look at the statistics, you know. 99% of the Fortune 500 boards have a woman. Um, you know, in 2015, 75% of tech boards had a woman, and, and this last year, 2016, uh, 87%. So the, the good news is, by measuring it, the numbers improve directionally. Mm -hmm. Now they could stop, right? They've got that tokenism. They've got that token female. So now what we all have to do and what those boards have to do is to be held accountable to reflect the diversity of the customer base that they serve. And that's where I always come down to, you know, old-fashioned business. If they stop at one, um, you know, that will be an issue. I was really taken by... State Street Advisors putting that statue in Wall Street on mm -hmm. International Women's Day mm -hmm. and basically saying that they would take a strong stance for companies that didn't have a third of uh, d women directors on the board. And I applaud them um, because it's more moves like that that will stop it being tokenism. And I do think that, um, so I have been on a number of big boards. I remain on uh, a couple of them. Um, there is... Again, it's partly the result of so much literature, so much evidence. People do understand now. People doing board search, for example, understand the dangers of tokenism. They understand that in order for, an organ for a group, whatever the group is, not to be stereotyped, you need to be more like 30% of, of, a, of a group, mm -hmm. not 1%, not 10%, 30 People know that. They do uh, know the evidence that uh, not only for your customer base, but also for your employees yes. themselves. I mean, if you think about it, I'm on the board of a, a big commercial uh, property uh, developer. And if you look in that organization, you will see a lot of women through the ranks. And that organization is now really seriously committed to significantly increasing the number of women on the board. And I would say it's an employee. Um, Situation. You're hitting on a really um, sort of leading edge driver, um, which is recruitment of great women into companies. We um, had a situation a few years ago with an amazing company that was doing really well, and they were trying to hire this incredible female executive. And she called me and she said, I really want to join this company. I, I think this company is amazing. I love the CEO. But their board are all white men. And um, it, it makes me very nervous that this is actually the sort of the tone of the company. Um, and I said to her, and it, was, and it was very true, which is that's not the case. They're an early stage company and part of your job is going to be helping to, to add to, and to change that. And she did, and she has. Fantastic. But I, I, it was the first time that someone had called me and said, I don't know if I'm going to join this company what because of that. What does it say? Mm -hmm. And so I think for any company to remain competitive, Diversity is not an option today, it's a mandate. It's a mandate. That's a wonderful way on which to end a fascinating discussion, which we could have kept up all day. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you.